Well, hello again and good evening. My name is Hayatun Silam, and I'm the Chief Executive at the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation. And I'm also a trustee of the Foundation for Science and Technology. It's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this event, which is being organised by the Foundation for Science and Technology, the British Science Association and the Science Council. A very warm welcome, whether you're joining in the room or on uh, Zoom. Uh, there's a, hopefully a good online audience as well as the uh, audience here in the Royal Society of Chemistry. So, as you know, the title of tonight's event is Equity, Diversity and Inclusion in STEM. And before I go on to say just a couple of words about that topic, I'd like to thank um, the Royal Society of Chemistry and Parrot Labour for their generous support of this event. These events are only possible with the support of our sponsors. So I'm really delighted to be in the chair this evening because this is a topic that is both a personal and a professional priority. Coming from the world of engineering, and uh, for those of you that don't know uh, the, the landscape in engineering, I can give you just one data point. We have a profession that is currently 16.5% women in the UK at the moment. So coming from that backdrop, it's impossible not to recognise the vital importance and indeed the urgency of improving EDI in STEM. There's now a really compelling uh, business case, evidence space for the benefits, organisational benefits of diverse teams working in inclusive cultures from talent retention, motivation, productivity to creativity and innovation, health and safety. I could go on, but you get the idea. So it's been good to see that the STEM community has embraced this as a collective priority in recent years, albeit that I think many of us in this room would probably have liked that to happen a bit more quickly. It's a multifaceted issue, of course. There are variations depending on whether you're looking at the ST or the E or the M in STEM, depending on which protected characteristics you're looking at, depending on which career stage you're looking at. And it's important that we recognise these different facets when thinking about how to make more progress on this issue. It's pleasing that the government too has recognised that this is a shared priority. And two years ago, for example, published the R&D People and Culture Strategy. Since then, a lot has changed in the world around us. But I think it's fair to say that the need for impactful action on this topic has not. Of course, one of the latest um, interventions, a significant piece of work has been provided by the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee uh, Science Innovation Technology Committee, sorry, I have to upgrade my nomenclature, um, who uh, in March this year published um, a report on this very topic. And the government response to that was then published just a couple of weeks ago. Now, we were very much hoping to be joined by the chair of the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee, Greg Clark, but unfortunately, he has had to pull out at the last minute. So we are incredibly grateful to Dr. Lillian Hunt for stepping in at very short notice to speak in place of Greg. And that means that we will have three excellent speakers to take us through the various different facets of EDI and STEM. And after that, the speakers will come together as a panel and we'll look forward to taking questions from both people in the room and those joining on Zoom. If you are joining via Zoom, you can ask your question at any point. You don't have to wait until the speakers have finished via the Q&A function, importantly, not the chat function. Um, so you, I'm sure, are also familiar with the fact that uh, you can comment on other people's questions and upvote them to show which questions have the most interest and support from the audience. And I will endeavour to make sure we get to all of those. And finally, if any of you want to tweet about the event, please feel free to do so using the hashtag EDI in STEM. So, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lillian Hunt. Dr. Lillian Hunt is the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Science and Health, or EDIS, lead in Wellcome's Culture, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion team. They received their PhD in genetics from UCL whilst at the Francis Crick Institute, where they helped bring together the founders of EDIS, or EDIS, I'm sorry, I should have checked EDIS, in 2016. Lillian has since developed the coalition supporting the 29 EDIS members to deliver on their EDI strategies covering inclusive research, culture and careers. Lillian, you're very welcome.
joking I am up here. Um, yeah, I've never replaced an MP before. That's quite fun. Maybe that suits me. Please no. Um, so, yes, last minute replacement, but hopefully be able to give you a bit of an overview of some of the work that the science, technology, uh, science, technology and innovation, science, innovation and technology, that way around today, uh, committee have put together, but also some of the work that's been going on in the sector within this space already. So as mentioned, I'm the lead for EDIS. Um, EDIS is a coalition of 29 organizations across the life science and health research sector who've come together with shared commitments around EDI. Primarily that it's important, secondary that you know, senior leadership need to be brought into it. And thirdly, that collaboration is really key to progress in this area. There's no point working with sort of random pockets of activity without working together towards shared goals, because often you find that those organizations, those activities, end up butting up against each other and you end up creating new frictions where someone's trying to start some sort of innovative idea, but actually it just fundamentally doesn't work in the rest of the system. So we're really trying to build that sort of co-creation, co-learning space. And at the same time, listening to what the members and what the sector needs to develop the kind of communal resources that fill those gaps. So where we find that, you know, 29 organizations are all saying to us, how do we collect diversity data? Trying to fill that gap a little bit for them as well. So we've got the DAISY guidance that we published a few years ago and regularly update as well. In terms of kind of what I was supposed to talk about today, um, not long before I came on stage, I was told to be provocative. Um, and I'm glad that I got that post having written provocative things down. Um, but I think it's super important to note that this work is obviously not new. This work has been going on for many, many years, many decades. Um, I may look baby-faced, I'm older than I am, but even then, I'm still a newcomer on the scene in the sort of long scholar scholarship and activism that's been working in this area. And I just think it's really important to recognise that some of those activities that have been going on for decades, particularly if we think about things like women in STEM and black women in STEM, there's decades of reports that go back to the sort of 60s and 70s, even within the US, within the UK and globally, that really are providing recommendations that we would have expected to see taken up by the Science Technology um, Committee today. And we would have expected the government to have responded saying that they would do those as well, because actually the problems fundamentally are still there and they are still the same. I think it's really important to note that the closest the government's response got to the committee inquiry today um, committee inquiry report was talking about entrenched imbalances, which is really pale language, really sort of damp, squib language. You know, it's just not talking about the fundamental problem, which is social, social uh, injustice and societal inequalities. What we know is that STEM is reflective of society. STEM is a part of society. We are not immune to societal inequalities. We're very much reflective of what's going on in the world today. And that includes the inequalities that we're seeing that get put into play through the different power imbalances that we see in careers, in structures, and even the way that prestige is held within the sector as well. Um, I think it's really important to note that the actual inquiry itself, sort of how that played out. So for those who haven't kind of had all the backstory for it, it's really, it's really important to note that in 2018, there was a My Science inquiry um, opening that was done through that committee, the pre pre one of the previous iterations, where the public could put their requests for inquiries. And it was um, Professor Rachel Oliver, with support of a group called Tigers and STEM now, who actually first submitted an inquiry um, suggestion on the impact of science funding policy on equ equality, diversity and inclusion and accessibility. So the reason we're here at this point with the inquiry is because of a grassroots push. And that's something to really recognize as well, is that a lot of the work done in this area is still coming from grassroots pushes, still coming from community activism, community justice, community collaboration. And actually what we've finally seen is that through into sort of a professionalized and sort of corporate and governmental sort of response here. But through that process, we've seen it watered down as well. And that's something to really recognize with any activity that we agree to do, whether that be today or tomorrow, is that we have to push further than what will be accepted because it will get toned down. And that's something to really think about. Um, the APPG on diversity in STEM, which was established with the British Science Association as secretariat, closely followed after that My Science inquiry. Um, and in 2019, the sort of science technology um, committee changed. There was a changing uh, government, changing committees. And actually, that inquiry then got shelved from that point as well. So in 2020, the APPG uh, inquiry, uh, the APPG on diversity in STEM set up the inquiry into equity in the STEM workforce, which actually creates a really fundamental and brilliant um, data piece that a lot of this was then foundational from. 
The Science Technology Committee launched their inquiry into diversity and inclusion in STEM finally in 2021. And now we are here in 2023 with a, re a report based on lots of pieces of evidence and a government response as well. And actually the committee themselves have said that the response from government is weak as well. It's a plan for a plan, I think was the quote. And I think we can all look at that and go, actually, yes, there was a, you know, I think we got down to paragraph 99 before we talked about anything other than education, of which most of it was deferred to the Department for Education. So I think it's important to look back a little bit and focus on what were the submissions of evidence from the public, from communities, from organisations into the original inquiry, and even some of the recommendations from that inquiry as well, because actually from that point onwards, it's kind of weakened and diluted a little bit. So as a collective, as a community, we can look at those earlier pieces and go, that's where the real teeth is. And that's where we can really look at what we want to do as a collective as well. Um, I think it's really important to note that that kind of balance of power that we have in society with the systems, the structures, access to and distribution of knowledge, resources, history, culture, people don't click that that is fundamental to STEM because they still have this idea that STEM is objective. And that includes the way that careers are structured in STEM being objective. Um, I think hopefully people are on board with the idea that that's not true. And um, we're all a product of who we are, who we've been for our lives, the people we interact with, anything from role models to your family, to the people within your jobs and your work, to your own identity as well. It influences the way that you prioritize things, influences the way that you interpret things, and it influences the way that you actually perform research or do any innovation or what it is that you're trying to achieve. So with that, I think it speaks to the earlier point that diversity and inclusion within the STEM research and innovation space is so fundamental to that harnessing that creativity because STEM is a creative pursuit. Innovation is a creative pursuit. So the idea that we would at any point force out groups based on their identity, based on their experiences, or even prejudice against groups from being able to express those parts of their creativity within the STEM workforce really does a, our entire country and a the whole, service, uh, the whole system a disservice. So I think it's really crucial that that business case, although it does feel like it's there, it does feel like it's spoken about, we just have to keep making sure that we re-mention it as well, because every time you walk into a room, there is someone who's going to be saying, well, why is that a problem? Unfortunately, in this inquiry, one of those people was the Minister for Equalities. So uh, that so shows kind of the state of the play. Um, and with that, I did want to kind of touch on a few Disappointing parts of the inquiry itself as well that I think is really important that we acknowledge happen. There are some difficult instances that really do need to be spoken about in a public forum um, because it really shows that, yes, people here are likely, you are likely here because you're interested in the subject. So you're either bought into the idea that diversity and inclusion needs to improve, that there is a problem, that there is potential for solutions. But we had an MP suggesting that young women chose physics at a particular university because of a sexy professor in the inquiry. We had an MP suggesting that disabled students should be prevented from getting access to proper adjustments because of other people gaming the system, despite us all knowing how difficult the system is to work with as a disabled student in the first place. We had a Someone gave evidence suggesting that, well, a few people gave evidence suggesting that girls don't do physics because they don't want to do hard maths, and that might be a natural thing. Um, and we also had a witness giving oral evidence who was pressured to name and shame employers and leaders who were uh, bullies or harassers or causing problems to the culture of the system that we work in without the committee ever considering what the impact of doing that in that forum would be without that committee knowing that NDAs are actually pervasive in our sector for um, silencing whistleblowers. And I think it's that kind of safeguarding that needs to be there as well. Um, and then, like I said, the MP for Equality is also suggesting that aiming for representation isn't actually important. Um, and also a massive disrespect for non-STEM subjects as well um, by really comparing this idea of kind of difficulty and usefulness and actually really disregarding the fact that STEM is fine, great, I love it, I was a geneticist myself, but without the ability to interact with cultural and historical reference points, STEM is somewhat useless because we end up repeating mistakes of the past in our methods, in our impact and things like that. So that's some of the stuff that I think is really important that we just air in this moment as well, because I think it's not, it's not been an inquiry that's been smooth sailing and it's not been an inquiry that's been completely positive and some of the kind of evidence pieces that did get heard would have affected some people in various ways as well. Um, 
Another thing that I wanted to sort of note as well is really that one of the things we put forward from EDIS's perspective, and I know this was difficult language to try and explain to a cross-party committee, was about this concept of this being a social justice issue. So this is really about putting a determination for fairness in the heart of what we're doing here, that this isn't just going to be a productivity business case that drives this. This has to be a fundamental fairness point. And that isn't just equality of opportunity, that's equality of outcomes, because the system has been so heavily weighted against some people for so long. And if we are seeing that there is significant underrepresentation and barriers that exist for people, um, that's leading to, you know, really missing out whole swathes of society in the STEM research and innovation endeavor, we know that the way that you counter that is not to just equal the playing field. It, you have to rebalance it for a while, at least for a while, before you can get to equality. I think the, the, the metaphor of rowing down a river and, you know, if you stop rowing, the river's still going to row, the, the river's still going to flow, you're still going to go down that direction. So you have to actively row against it. And I think that's something that we need to really recognize. The other thing I also wanted to talk about was that, like I said, the original, the response that we've got from government has focused a lot on education and early years education, uh, secondary education. And those are really important factors for that start of the career journey. However, they really didn't comment or note on the fact that the science capital that you're building within that space as a secondary school student, maybe into university, that's not something, a concept that needs to be lost throughout your whole of your career. Building science capital throughout your entire career, whether that's in research, in innovation, in academia, in industry, wherever you go, science capital as a concept is really important because it's not just what you know, it's going to be a lot of who you know, it's going to be a lot of where the opportunities are, it's going to be a lot of how do you explain and describe the work you're doing in a way that's engaging, how do you engage with people who want to fund it? How do you engage with people who want to employ you? How do you engage with even investors if you want to spin an idea out into something? You know, these are all really important parts. And those, that, that concept of science capital isn't just given to you as a, as a given. <laughs> you know, you are waiting to hear if you've got someone to support you in that, um, someone to describe it. There isn't a, there's, there's a clear reason why a lot of Nobel Prize winners have Nobel Prize winner parents and PhDs have PhD parents. You know, it's because someone's told you how that system works and told you the value and the benefit of it. And that often can have a huge impact on the choices you make. Um, the other thing to just note around the government response again, so a 2030 target of a more diverse range of people to enter the science and technology workforce. It's an interesting choice of words. Um, <laughs> Entering the science and technology workforce does not mean staying in the science and technology workforce. It does not mean thriving there. It does not mean enjoying your work. It does not mean being the best version of yourself and producing the best version of the work that you want to produce. Um, and a more diverse range of people could be as simple as moving that 16% women in engineering to 18%. So I think that's something that we all need to think about, which is actually setting quotas, setting targets, setting things like that. They have they have negative consequences sometimes, but no data, no numbers is not a choice. It's not something that you, you can't just aim for more diversity because who knows what that really means. Um, and I'm also really interested to know which government official is really into maths mastery pedagogy because that really featured quite heavily in their response as well. And if anyone wants to explain that to me, I'm not aware of that subject. I'm not aware of that method myself. So I'd be interested after drinks for that. Um, the other thing just to note as well, in terms of the culture that we're working in, we know, we know that people have experienced the culture within the science, technology, innovation, research workforce differently. We know that there's a lot of mixed uh, opinions about whether competitiveness is a positive or a negative there. But we also know that from the Wellcome Trust uh, Research Culture Survey, that 43% of researchers had experienced bullying or harassment. And I think something close to 60 or 70% had witnessed it as well. So the Forum Against Bullying and Harassment is progressing. But those numbers are still shocking. And I think that's something to also recognize that there are some targeted interventions, targeted actions that do correlate in, across the whole of the sector that we can focus on. Um, I just wanted to just note that this, the kind of the six recommendations that EDA's put forward, which on the face of it, when I say them right now, they're going to be seeming quite high level. But what we did do in our response was also list really specific interventions that sit under each of those. So the first one was around investing in inclusive STEM education with a focus on building science capital across all stages. 
And we meant that in terms of across all career stages beyond PhD into whatever part of your career happens after that. We also know that you need to take proactive steps to remove bias and ensure equal outcomes, which is a fantastic way of telling them equitable action and positive action without saying those words, because we knew it might put some of them off. Um, we want to support organizations to create change and embed good practice. We know there's lots of practice happening. How do we ensure that it's happening well within organizations when we know that something's going well? We know that legal frameworks need to be updated and we need to ensure dissemination and uptake of guidance. Again, thinking about positive action there, there's a lot of availability and service provisions for positive action that are worth looking at uh, if you're a charity, for example, that aren't really spoken about in our space as much. We want to invest in positive culture and incentives that reflect um, diverse contributions. And when we say invest, we mean money. So we want to see numbers there. Um, and we want to improve consistency in the design, implementation, and monitoring of EDI interventions. And we're happy to kind of take on some of that space as well. So with that, I just wanted to finally say thank you to um, everyone from the EDIS community, from the membership who contributed to that um, piece of work. It was a real sort of gaining everyone's insights there. Um, my co-authors, Anna and Rachel, who are actually in the room as well, who helped write it. And Anna presented the oral evidence in person for us as well. Um, and I think I'll stop there because I have no idea what time I'm on. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Lillian, for some really interesting reflections that I think provide us with some excellent stimulus for the debate later on. Um, I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, Rachel Lambert Forsyth, who is the Chief Executive of the British Pharmacological Society and Managing Director of BPS Assessment Limited. And prior to this, she held a number of positions at the Royal Society of Biology, and she is also the trustee of the Science Council, where she holds the role of diversity champion. Please come to the stage, Rachel. Lost my notes, which is a really good start. So let me just bring them up again. No, oh, it's all good. I'm going to go with that one. Um, so thank you, first of all, for inviting me to speak. Um, and yes, my day job is the um, British Pharmacological Society, but I think I'm very much here as the trustee for the Science Council in Equality, Diversity, Inclusion. Um, and it's been a real privilege to hold that role at the Science Council. Um, it was a, a board level appointment that we, I kind of was the first one to be holding, to hold it. Um, and I'm stepping down with the trustee board in a matter of weeks, um, but I'm really pleased that I'm kind of handing the baton to Jade Hall, who's also in the audience, um, who leads on EDI at the Royal Society of Biology and has come on board as a recent trustee of the Science Council. So I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about the Science Council, um, what we do and how we've been working in this space and our sort of role as a, a convener, I guess, in, in the sector. So for those of you who uh, maybe don't know the Science Council so well, we are a membership organization um, and there's 36 of leading professional bodies and learner societies, um, including the Royal Society of Chemistry, who are obviously kindly hosting us today. And as a, as a sort of organization, collectively through the membership of all of those organizations, it represents over 300,000 scientists and technicians. And that gives it a really um, kind of important opportunity to bring the collective power of those societies together to see if we can address some of those challenges that um, Lillian has so um, well kind of outlined in that first presentation. In terms of the Science Council, I guess historically it's been primarily responsible for professional registration in science. But more recently, we have been looking to build our role as a infrastructure organization. And part of that is this kind of policy program, which includes putting together events like today to help kind of engage in that debate um, and have really interesting conversations. Um, as I mentioned, the sort of EGI bit is the other area I lead on. And it was so we were kind of really delighted to see the House of Commons Science, Innovation and Technology Select Committee. I definitely need to learn that one as well. Um, earlier this year, but we were equally disappointed to read the government, government's response and um, kind of really hear a lot of what Lillian said around the sort of the statements that are in there, very, very watered down, very um, sort of, yeah, just not very interesting to read, quite frankly. Um, and you could sort of see that there wasn't, you, how we were going to take it forward, it felt like a very blah response. Um, and so in terms of kind of moving it forward, then I think it is really important to look back at what can we do? What frameworks do we have in place that can help move the dial forward? So kind of going back to the Science Council, 
one of the areas that we've been working on for a number of years is the Declaration on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, this was developed by the Science Council with its membership back in 2014. And all members of the Science Council sign up to this declaration when they join, and it is supposed to be an kind of outward um, statement of their kind of commitment to making sure that EGI is really embedded across the organisation. Um, it's used to hopefully drive commitment and action for work in this area, and it should help develop kind of member strategies and action plans as well as increase also the sort of general resources to support engagement and culture change. In 2022, we looked again at that declaration and we updated it. Um, and there was a couple of kind of key areas, but one of the key ones was to update the language. So we moved from a declaration on equality, diversity, inclusion to a declaration on equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, for many of the reasons that Lillian has uh, mentioned already, that actually we want to work towards um, equality of outcomes and we do that through, through equity. In terms of the sort of de oh, in terms of the sort of declaration itself, um, you know, the sort of statement there is very much the summary of it. I'm not going to read it word for word. You can you can obviously see it there. Um, but it sort of talk it, it really talks about living the values. Um, what does that mean though in practice, I think is one of the challenges that we all face within our organizations. Just kind of thinking a little bit further detail about that declaration. So within it, there are um, some four key areas that we commit, we ask organizations to commit to. First one is appointing that board level diversity champion. And that role is to work in partnership with the senior executive um, team in the organization to advocate the importance of equity, diversity and inclusion. And it's really important that that is that senior leadership team. It has to come from the top of the organization an interest and a passion and an enthusiasm for and a commitment to moving this work forward, because otherwise it's not going to ever be embedded in the strategy and the sort of the, 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 you know, the organization right at the heart of it. It's not going to be that sort of common golden thread that's running through all of your programs, all of your projects, all of your outcomes, all of your decisions, all of your processes. And it also ensures that there's real accountability at that board level, but also with the senior leadership team about improving practice and communicating what the EDI strategies are, how staff, membership and other stakeholders can get involved and what we're doing to kind of take that forward. The second area is around planning and implementing a programme of work to really embed those principles into the organisation. And again, this is about enhancing the quality of opportunity and the for our activities in both the employer and professional body space. The third one is around measuring, assessing and reflecting on progress and ultimately reporting on activities. And again, we've touched on this already, but kind of data is really, really important here. Um, it's really nice to say we're going to move towards broader diversity. But as I said, what does that really mean? How can we really measure that if we don't know what our baselines are? How can we know if we have made a real difference if we don't continue to measure and report on, the, on that data? It has to be something that is committed to on an annual basis and obviously in between that as well. And it's something where actually our membership can really hold organizations accountable as well by saying, you know, what you've said these nice words, what are you really doing about it? Show me the data about how this is improving. How is that program helping us to move that needle forward? And then ultimately the sort of the final area of the declaration is about that, goes back to that convening opportunity within the Science Council. We want to share progress and we want to share learning across the sector. Because um, again, I sort of reflect on the points made already that there is a lot of work that has already been done and is being done in lots of different organisations. And what we want to try and do is reduce that duplication and bring together that learning so that we are sharing that good practice um, and we're really targeting our, all of our resources into the places we, where we can make the most difference. Um, this slide won't be, uh, you know, I'm sure it's one that you will have seen many, many times before. Um, just kind of want to acknowledge that I took this slide from a recent presentation by um, Professor Louise Archer. And we talked about Science Capital just now and uh, Louise's work um, on the Aspires project, which has been going since 2009, really coined that phrase of Science Capital. Um, and it's really great to kind of hear from her recently that that has continued um, as a longitudinal study to look at how science capital really does make a difference and that it is at different stages that this changes and flexes depending on when those young people are um, 
engaging with different different points that will impact their decision making whether that be kind of careers advice whether it be parents whether it be friends whether it be um out of the world of work um whether it be kind of in, in many kind of many touch points where we see science capital either being built or being diminished um, and i think some of the work that professor archer has led here can really help organizations like the science council and, and others in the room here to understand how we can affect change in the system to widen and increase participation in STEM long term. And I think for the Science Council in particular, in reviewing that declaration, as I mentioned, we took the decision to change that language to reflect the practice towards working to ensure actual approaches are harnessed so that we did meet those equality of outcomes. However, the membership and I think kind of raising a challenge, our membership is pretty broad and our organisations are, are different in size, uh, resources, um, in their journey along this EGI path as well. And so it hasn't been without its challenges, even within our own organization, to change that use of language. We've had to spend a lot of time working with, our, working with the member organizations to unpick what does that really mean in practice? Because again, you can change the language, but if you don't know what you're doing in practice, what's the point? But I think, you know, we could go further. And of course, social justice is that sort of next step. Um, and this is about therefore looking at where are those barriers? Where can we um, create, where, where can we look at how we break down the things that are maintaining those inequalities? Um, now I'm not gonna talk in detail about Professor Archer's research as obviously I'm not the expert here, um, but a couple of points that I think it's useful to bring to the surface from what I got from what she was saying especially as we're focusing on how the government might work with the STEM sector to support EGI programmes. There have been, over the years, many extensive investments to widen and increase participation in STEM. We've talked about that already. And, you know, how do we bring that together? How do we ensure data is underpinning that to see what's working and what's not? Stop what's not working, what's damaging, and in continue with the programmes that are making a real difference. Um, but despite all of those investments, science and STEM remains dominated by privileged people. So, you know, by that I mean white, male, middle-class, able-bodied, um, non-neurodiverse, et cetera. And especially in subjects like engineering, like we've spoken already, and physics and computing, but it's not solely the issue of those subjects. And the issues are unique to each of the disciplines in and across STEM. And so the existing efforts, part of the problem um, in, in Professor Archer's view is that it has been deficit-based. Um, I, it's kind of focusing on changing the young people rather than changing the system around them. The sort of like, how can we get more, more into them rather than actually saying, well, they are existing in a system where it's not working. How do we break down those um, barriers to, and which are creating inequalities? Um, and kind of one of the conclusions that I took from it is that Professor Archer's research suggests that it's therefore not a lack of interest and motivation. That's the main issue. And it is the educational settings and it is the practices um, that play a role in excluding and uh, dissuading students from choosing STEM and science. Um, and that's therefore where this kind of concept of social justice is really important to progress further. Just kind of in terms of final takeaways from that work, for me, um, a couple of things that I have really taken on and would be good to kind of explore further is that it's not just about what we do as an organization, but the way that we do it, that is important. So really embedding social justice into that, really embedding kindness, really embedding understanding is really important as well as what we, what we ultimately do, it's how, how we do that. That we have to put equity and social justice at the heart of our approaches, this is absolutely critical. Um, and that ultimately what we'll find in our own um, organizations is that often the underpinning values and mindset that determine the equitable potential of our practice are kind of come from us. So we have to be more self-reflective and open to critical analysis of our own natural biases and how this presents in our decision-making. So we have to be thoughtful about our decision-making. So just kind of, I'm gonna bring you back to the Science Council for a minute. So the other area of work for the Science Council in this space has been the progression framework. Um, and this was developed back in 2016, um, and it was a collaboration between the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Science Council. Um, and it was put in place to help professional bodies 
track and plan progress on diversity and inclusion. We updated it together in 2020 um, as the progression framework 2.0. Um, and it sets out four levels of practice, of kind of good practice um, in this space around the 10 areas of activity that on the whole professional engineering institutions, scientific bodies um, cover in their sort of broad, broad kind of collective space. And what it does is it provides a, a really nice data framework to assess each of those functions against the four level maturing model. Um, and the aim underneath it is essentially to give a bit of a, you know, a, a moment in time opportunity for us to assess as organizations, how we're doing, whether there are areas where we need to invest more time or effort into, where can we are doing really well and where do we want to do more of that? Um, and to be introspective and insightful about what we're doing but also to seek stakeholder views on how our work in this space um, is viewed. Um, and recently, this framework um, for the implementation group that sort of looks after it, um, our social quo to facilitate a theory of change um, process to better reflect on the impact of this framework and to explore the organizational and collective sort of impact of taking part. Um, and I think sort of building on that work around, on that point I've made earlier about longitudinal study, I think we haven't used this well enough. I think there's more opportunities for us to look at the data and to really think about what types of longitudinal studies could we do to study and understand how we as professional bodies and we as learner societies are, are, are doing this, how we are doing in this space. Because this is concrete data. We can be collecting it, we can be analysing it, we can be thinking about what does this mean in practice. Um, so finally, I'm just going to sort of wrap up in thinking about everything that I've spoken about and for me, how that links therefore to the select committee report and, and how we might address some of the key issues. So the report highlighted that need for sector to take a more systematic approach to the challenge. Um, I think all of us will agree with that. Um, and making the STEM ecosystem, you know, in their words, a beacon of good practice when it comes to addressing that underrepresentation. And in some ways, this is exactly what the Science Council has been um, trying to do for our community. And so we'd really, you know, really keen to kind of work with the government um, to understand how the work that we've been doing in this space can support and grow this activity further. Some of the examples of good practice given in the, in the reports around diversity of groups making decisions, various hiring practices, are a great challenge to the community. And is there ways that we as Science Council can convene and share and discuss those ideas further? And obviously this. Um, forum is a good opportunity to start that discussion. We know the data collection is a big challenge and as you know we've learned ourselves as the Science Council we it's vitally important to have that data otherwise we can't take that long-term and evidence-based approach to the challenge and part of the issue here is about us being really clear about why we're collecting data what we're going to use it for and then as I mentioned already kind of reporting that back to our membership and to the sectors that we support. Um, so I'm going to finish there. Um, I hope that's given you a bit of a flavour of the Science Council and kind of our work and I'm really interested to have further conversation. Thank you very much, Rachel, for that very helpful perspective from the Science Council and in particular for showcasing again the progression framework, which I agree has a lot of untapped potential. Our final speaker is Kevin Coutinho who is the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Lead Trustee at the British Science Association. He is also Pro-Director Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the Chair of the Board for the Windsor Fellowship. So as such, he has extensive experience of EDI programme implementation at both the principles level and the practice level. Kevin, please do come to the stage. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here this evening. Um, I'm going to say, how do you follow two very passionate speakers? Um, not easily, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be honest, okay? But what I wanted to do was to take us through what the British Science Association has been doing, because I think it's that journey that we are all going through, if we really want to see change, that we need to understand, we need to reflect on, and we need to improve on. Um, the BSA, we've been around since 1831. Um, that's a long time, but so it would seem. 
However, when we're thinking about some of the challenges that we're dealing with around equality, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and I use, all, I use both these because I think in the context of the UK, they all are relevant. In that context, those challenges and that journey are one that we need to reflect on and to think about. So we have, a, since 2015, we've been on a journey and it's a journey not as yet with a destination. It's a journey for us to think about how do we engage and support inclusion and diversity from communities that otherwise aren't here. It's not that they're not there, but they're not part of our community. And if they're not part of our community, STEM is the poorer for it. Now, I've worked in higher education for 15 years. I've worked in the voluntary sector, and I say work, it is work, um, for the best part of 23 years. And in that time, I've seen change, but it feels very slow. So I'm going to say that change feels too slow. Um, I like metaphors. So I'm a bad diabetic, so I do like a chocolate bar. And the chocolate bar of choice for this is an aero bar or a whisper. It's very bubbly, and lots of things that happen don't seem to be connected very well. And when we think about how we include different communities, that's really fundamental. So at the BSA, we've been trying to think about how do we engage with different communities? How do we do this practically? So we've heard about some of the challenges from the report. We've heard about some of the issues that we have with it. But we have a couple of examples that we run that actually help us to think about engaging different communities. The two obvious ones that I could call upon are the British Science Week and the CREST program. And we're pleased to say that in the response from government, which we are not all as satisfied as we'd like to be, um, let's say it could be a bit stronger, um, but we're see, pleased to see that two programs that we're part of are, are mentioned. However, they're not the only two programs. So I'm going to talk about those programs, but I want colleagues in the room to recognize that there's lots of good practice taking place across the STEM communities. Now, the challenge for us is how do we harness that in a way that leads to systemic change? And part of the challenge that I'm going to talk through is the, the fact that we need leadership and coordination, but we don't always seem to get it. So the, the CREST program um, has been running um, with over 50,000 people going through it. Now, why is it important? Well, we, we all recognize, and I think the speakers that have spoken before me have actually said very clearly, STEM capital, science capital, starts at a young age. And like any good investment, it needs to be nurtured, it needs to be supported, and it needs to be retained. And the problem very often we talk about is our leaky pipelines. But the leaky pipeline, as has been said, tends to focus on the water, not the infrastructure. And it's the poor infrastructure that holds people in and retains them that actually causes barriers and the attrition that we see, because we have good numbers coming through. We have numbers coming through, and not all disciplines, as we know in engineering, are the same. But recognizing that even where we do see high numbers coming through, the retention and progression isn't equitable. And that goes back to that importance of equity. So from our perspective, we need to think about what can we do to retain. So CREST is a really helpful example from our perspective at the BSA, where we work with students, we work with students who are women from minoritized ethnic backgrounds, work from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, to help them understand what STEM and STEM problems they could face and how they could engage with them practically to understand um, and improve and solve them. Um, the program has been running and has got support from a number of different stakeholders. And we're very pleased to say that the Welsh Government actually resources it so that every secondary school student in Wales can access it. Now that's systemic. So there are different experiences where we have top-down engagement. So it's not just, it, so when we talk about the UK and the home nations, it's important for us to understand that there are different experiences. So for anybody else who's from Wales or from Scotland, please remember that there are different experiences and approaches and that those need to be recognized and actually thinking, thought about and reflected upon in terms of what we could do here in England. But not the whole story. A big part of the story, but not the whole story. I think the other part about the BSA is that we are very keen about thinking uh, around community engagement. So there are a range of different initiatives that are taking place. We're not the only ones. Um, 
you know, communities should lead their own sciences, bottom-up engagement, engagement from schools, but into other communities. So we've got a number of different programs that we've been resourcing and supporting and partnering with. What we're very proud to say is that we've actually looked at our programs and we undertake evaluations. And through those evaluations, we can understand that the engagement that we are getting is diverse in terms of disability, mental health, age, um, race, and gender. Um, but more importantly, people think that the, in the program that we're working on are actually helping them to increase their science capital. And that, for us, is an outcome. Now, it's not the only outcome. And actually, when we're thinking about the stages in this picture, that we're thinking about and the engagement piece and that retention, how do we map out these different interventions so that we can create a pathway of referrals onto different programs and different initiatives so that that retention issue, that retention question, becomes something that we deal with systematically and systemically? We know, and we note with some disappointment, that we want to see greater um, engagement in, in, in terms of government responses. Um, but we, are, we actually value that important, the role of policy and influencing in the work that we're doing. So, you know, as part of the, we provide secretariat for the all-party parliamentary group on diversity and inclusion in STEM. And that's chaired by Chi Onwara, uh, MP. Um, but we've also undertaken a number of different research into public attitudes. So yesterday, there was a launch of a report looking at how um, climate change is included in the curriculum. It worked with the University of Plymouth to undertake a research project into understanding perceptions of teachers, students, and drawing together um, ways in which we could actually improve what we're doing. Now, there is no quick fix to this because there's so many different stakeholders that need to be involved in how we do this effectively. But through the work that we're doing and helping us to understand the challenges and the issues, there's an opportunity for us to think about who do we need to influence. We have to recognize that the change is coming, perhaps in terms of government, but in terms of funding priorities and in partners that we can work with. But it's not just down to um, the BSA. We recognize that. And there'll be colleagues in the room who are part of that discussion that we want to work with. It's really important for us all to understand and keep reminding ourselves that representation does matter. When we walk into rooms and we don't see the profile of people that we would like to see when we're children, and that that profile doesn't change as we go through our education and employment journeys, that representation gaps becomes a barrier for us to feel like we belong. And the dissonance in terms of STEM is highly problematic because it's problematic for individuals, it's problematic for the STEM community, but it's problematic for us as a society. And so whilst, we, whilst I, I'm, go, I'm going to say the point about targets and data indicators, becomes that much more important because this happening in the abstract doesn't allow us, it does not allow us to actually do this work in a, with a very clear sense of goal and purpose. And that's what we want to encourage others in this room to think about. How do we work collaboratively? How do we help to identify the issues? But also, how do we make progress in ways that are meaningful? Once we recognize that the lack of diversity um, is a problem, we also recognize that the, the response is a little bit disappointing. Let's be honest, okay? Um, and there's something there about keeping this conversation real. There is a disappointment that there, is, there isn't that same leadership, but the leadership in some ways has to be bottom up. It comes from colleagues in this room that will help the sector and our communities to improve. And it won't be a straight line. We recognize that the challenges are zigzaggy in the sense of making progress, but understanding where we want to get to becomes really critical. So we say, we want, we were probably, you know, we're very happy to see that the inquiry into diversity and uh, inclusion in STEM has taken place. We thank all those who were involved in the report. We now need to think about how do we collectively nudge action in the right direction and a direction that improves that diversity and inclusion in STEM. We recognize that there are so many initiatives out there. You know, I'm talking about the ones from the BSA, but I could equally talk about the ones from colleagues who's talking from the Science Council. I can talk about the work that's being done with Jeep at the Royal Academy of Engineering. I can talk about Destination STEM, and here at the Royal Society of Chemistry, and I think they deserve a little plug since they're hosting us. 
Um, we can talk about initiatives like Broadening Horizons, which is work in partnership with industry to increase the opportunities for people from minoritized ethnic backgrounds in STEM. You know, the, there are so many initiatives out there, but what we probably need is more coordination, greater engagement and leadership, and clarity about what the data indicators are. Because whilst HESA in higher education gives us lots of data, um, if anybody's familiar with HESA data, you know there's so much data out there, but the actual data that we want to see um, in terms of understanding the workforce isn't there. And that longitudinal workforce data becomes very critical if we want to take this work forward. So there's leadership, there's data, and then there's education. And that education piece is what the BSA has been working on very clearly through our CREST program. Um, but we need to think about how we make sure that that sustained engagement actually works from school right into retirement, because it isn't just about getting into the entry-level roles, it's about being leaders in STEM. And everybody has a role to play in that. And on that note, I'm going to leave us and invite us all to think about the next steps in terms of our questions. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, for rounding that off. Um, we've got some questions coming in already on the floor, um, or mine rather, but I'm going to start with one from online. And I'd love to come to the Zoom, so please do have your questions at the ready. Um, but I, I feel like this, this is an appropriate place to start, bearing in mind what you've all said. So there's a question from Gillian Charlesworth. There's a brilliant opening speech reflecting all the issues with Frank's character. Is the conclusion that we should forget about government supporting this agenda? and focus on our own efforts and perceptions. So I'm going to start with Lillian, but I'd love to hear from Rachel and Kevin as well. Lillian. Yeah, thank you for that question online. Um, quite funny enough, I've actually <laughs> written down a note whilst Kevin was speaking there, which said, interesting to see what progress has been made without government support. So actually similarly sort of uh, ideas there in terms of, you know, let's be real, the government's work on the four-year election cycle at best um, so therefore, the, there, there will always be limitations as to what we can get through. The people and culture strategy is supposed to be for a longer term, but even that came in and out before it came back. Um, so I think it is important to think, you know, there is plenty of opportunity without that support. The issue with that, though, does end up coming down to money. And actually understanding that this is an investment, this does cost more money. Often it costs more money up front and then you get the payout a lot longer term as well. So a lot of the investment into improving access to careers, accessibility of even labs, all of those sort of things, that upfront investment that has long-term beneficial impacts. And when we work in a system that's still very much working with economics alongside ethics, we have to recognize that that government support is needed if we want to make some of the big changes and the flip side is that there are some organizations, and this is you know, obviously sat within Wellcome Trust, that are independent, that have vast amounts of resources and funding, and are starting to put their money where their mouth is and really sort of prove that actually that, that does make a huge difference. What we can't do is plug that gap entirely because then the government will not act in that space. And we do see that in other areas, not related to EDI, but other actual just investment areas in, entirely, where if the gap's plugged, why would they change their strategy and their approach? So, it's a double-edged sword. I think, there, like I said, lots of opportunity to do work without their support and investment, but we should not be forgetting about getting their support and investment. Thank you very much, Lee. And I'm going to ask Kevin next. Um, Rachel, um, I think that's a very fair assessment. I'm going to not disagree. <laughs> okay. I think the need for government leadership as a society that actually has values around inclusion in STEM and in any part of our life, it's critical to have a, pol pol a political class that actually understands that this is an issue. You know, we can't pretend that the role that government plays isn't going to affect how we do this work. However, we can be reassured that there are many partners in this, in this room, I can see some here, um, who understand how important that is. So the, the point here is not about whether we should do it without government. We can do it without government. But is it going to be more effective, efficient, and engaging if we have government on board? 
And the answer is yes. Very clear. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, and I think I would add on that point. I think this is about partnership and understanding where the, the different actors have the ability to make a difference. So let's be really vocal about where we think that government should be putting their time and effort and be really clear about where we as a sector can step up to the plate and fill those gaps as well. And I think that goes back to sort of the duplication points that have been made. But I think there is, for me, it's, it's always about partnership and it's always about understanding where do you have the levers that you're going to pull on who has the, the space at the table, the voice in the room, the resources, the finances to maybe do some of those greater changes, that we have a huge opportunity as a sector to say, you know, we're here, we're doing lots of great work. Um, we want to work in a supportive way to understand what's going on. Yeah, I think what we should now do is take a few interventions from the floor and then let people pick on the ones that they want to go next. But we'll cross the, at the back, so on there, and we'll work our way through. Hi, uh, John Punter, Institute of Physics. I work in public affairs there. Really welcome everything that was said about the uh, Select Committee report, particularly the government's response. I think we called it a betrayal in our, in our response to them. Um, I didn't hear really much about the potential for the next government. We've all seen the polling. We all know what may well happen. Given Labour hasn't even changed its front bench to recognise the new uh, 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 DSIT department. I read recently actually that Lucy Powell may be shuffled in very sh shortly to that. I'm really interested <coughs> in the panel's views on the efforts to engage Labour because Labour's not really engaging with the science issue in any way. I personally, it's not IOP's position, have given up on the Conservative government, particularly because uh, the current science minister has thrice ignored. Uh, so I'm really interested in what the panel thinks we should engage with Labour going forward because they may be in power for another good <coughs> five years. Uh, Samantha Mansa, I'm with the Atomic Weapons Establishment. Um, moving away from uh, government and going more into um, workplaces. So we've talked a lot about how um, there seems to be a general focus on attraction, but then moving away from retention of um, diverse employees, academics, students, um, especially in such a lar large organization that's been dominated, traditionally dominated by white, uh, middle-class, straight men. Um, there are some pockets of cultures that seem quite resistant to change. And we've implemented the traditional um, approaches of anti-harassment training, um, uh, unconscious bias training. But then when you're trying to tackle those, what seems like innate behaviors that really, really contribute to people not feeling like they have a place in the industry, and I'm sure it's not unique to just nuclear, and it's not just unique to where I work. Um, what can you do about that? What can we have instead if those, those traditional, uh, traditional solutions aren't really hitting the spot? Uh, thanks, Hyphen. Um, uh, John Wood, um, a consultant at CERN on innovation. Um, I'm very reluctant to even ask a question, but I want to go back to the online question, if I may, because it was in my mind, is that I work with a charity here in London where we support a school uh, with disadvantaged kids, and we support a robotics club in the secondary school. It's 50-50, boys and girls. It's cascaded down to primary schools, more girls than boys. One of those girls in the sixth form has just gone to Caltech on a scholarship. Terrific. That's just one intervention. But also they sent me yesterday a film that uh, was run by Deutsche Bank in bringing girls into science and education, giving them the vision of what was there in industry. And this school also works with British Aerospace. And I've also been working with um, uh, Robert Bosch Foundation where they take the women uh, at, now at PhD and postdoctoral level, and we help them have confidence to go forward. So at every level, there are different interventions. 
But I've noticed it's the businesses and the charities that really start making things work. So I disagree with you about government. We can ditch them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. I'm not sure that requires a response to them. Um, so, so let's just cover off the first couple. Who'd like to start with advice to Labour? <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, I'm looking at you. <laughs> oh, that's a really tough one. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a difficult it's difficult because I think as organisations, it kind of goes back to the resource point around where can we best direct our resources as organisations. And, you know, quite frankly, at the moment, it's, easy, it, it's better if you've got limited resources to direct it at the government that's in power and therefore has the ability to make those changes. That all being said, you know, there's, there's a lot of writing on the wall at the moment, isn't there, in terms of the political landscape that we live in. And sh we should, as organisations, throughout any site, political cycle, actually, to be engaging with both sides of the House and all sides of the House, um, and it be engaging in that cross-party approach. Because as we see through the APPPGs, there are areas where they do work across, across those political boundaries, and I think it then can really help us in some of the points that have been made earlier around, we need something that's longer than the four-year cycle. Um, so if we're not engaging with all political parties, then we kind of we inherently encourage that four-year cycle change mm -hmm. um, and we're not engaging in the conversations that maybe help them see that maybe interventions that one party has put into place is good and should be carried on when a new party comes into place. And I think we definitely saw that when we moved from Labour to the Conservative government, whoever we need to do today. Thank you, Rachel. I'm going to ask Stephanie to take us on the question when you get to those cross-party that exist within a workplace culture. Um, your reflections on that based on um, Going back to my, my favourite metaphor, the aero bar, we all know that there are certain individuals in organisations who, to be very blunt, don't want to change. And at some level, there's an, ele there's an element of bypassing them. At some element, there's an element of what are the external drivers that might motivate change, whether that comes from funding bodies. I note organizations like the Welcome that demand or expect to see plans around good practice around EDI. But there are lots of, there, so those funding bodies, those external drivers become very important. The issue that we also have is, to about, is about remembering about management capabilities. So once people go through what we would call sheep for training, so they'll go for a training course for two or three hours, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be managed well and managed effectively. Now, we, we are operating a very tight labor market at the moment. There is the, 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 you know, the scarcity of talent. And I've seen this in the time that I've been in higher education, but also in the voluntary sector. If you don't treat the staff well, eventually they'll walk. They shouldn't have to walk. We shouldn't have as organizations to face the loss of talent but we know it happens all too often. So the real challenge to us is actually how do we systematize better practice? And actually, it isn't just about the training and the management, it is about making sure that there are true accountabilities for people that don't manage well. And that could be loss of funding, that could be loss of management responsibility because management responsibility comes with a premium in normally in your salary. Um, but it's about actually organizations being honest about the challenges that they face. And actually, that challenge, whether it's about non-disclosure agreements, okay, and the, 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 the need to actually regulate how those are used, when we're thinking about public funding, um, when we're thinking about the grant funding, um, it's a very, for individuals, it's a horrible experience to be on the receiving end of bullying and harassment. Anybody who's ever experienced it knows how traumatizing and how long that lasts with you. For organizations, it's an invisible cost quite often, um, but it actually is a cost that I don't believe is sustainable to re at a loss to carry on sustaining. Thank you. And I let me just add certainly from my point of view. Um, you know, we have to recognize this is a major cultural change that takes place. So people can come from all sorts of different um, contexts, but what often seems to be most effective is when you get uh, outcomes in relation to hardwired into the organizational definition of success. So it doesn't come from some other than what should be the definition of success. And that's completely 
reward and recognition, but also dealing with remedial cases, that starts to feel much more real to people. And then also recognising that people um, may need help converting that into legal tools. So practical tools, which there are now many, uh, our organisation, but pretty much everyone on this panel, I'm sure, um, will, will be able to provide examples of those. Uh, because what we need to do is move forward collectively faster rather than through individual learning. Lots and lots of organisations uh, are grappling with this, and there are organisations like those that we've heard who are trying to catalyse collective forward movement. Um, I'd love to hear, Lillian, if there are any reflections on either of those questions. And I'm going to throw in another one for good measure. Oh, so, <laughs> um, from the online questions we've got, uh, where can you see international examples of this learning strategy? What's, what's the international um, best practice that you could be inspired by? So, I'll let the others sort of ponder on that one a little bit as well, as well as just gather the thoughts from the previous questions. Um, I think the the question around the kind of the training that's there, specifically thinking around anti-harassment training and unconscious bias training, what I, what I will confess is that rolling out a training intervention often is an acceptable solution, which I think is indicative of the type of organization you're in if that's the primary solution that people are working with. If it's just a case of, okay, we just need to train people, we just, they just need to know, they just need to know more. Um, often what you find that is that's because that's an acceptable way for an executive, for a leadership team to go, yep, we've done something rolled out some training but it's what is it with that's really important because yes there are some things that will need some sort of upskilling training but actually is that then put into a career framework that's in the organization is that like we're saying you know embedded within the, the values of excellence of, that, of what good looks like you know if those are missing then the training will fall flat because it's a one-shot intervention and it doesn't often lead to actual persistent behavior change except for those who are already engaged who will probably go off and do the work themselves anyway. So I think that's something to think about, which is if that's all that's being done, that's face value work. That's not actual fundamental change to the structure and culture of the organization. And then that speaks to a little bit of, as well of what was being said around the kind of the culture change includes those drivers and levers of accountability, um, which innately do have to rely on some level of power. And that includes power over, power with, power, power to, but it, it's thinking about, okay, if we're going to be holding people accountable for not meeting those expectations of behavior, of values, of intent, you know, what happens then? And actually, that's where, again, a lot of organizations fall down because the consequences, as it were, the responsibility and what happens isn't happening at the same time as those trainings. Um, with that, I also want to note that often we talk about these stuff, this stuff in quite the extreme as well. So, you know, incidents of bullying, harassment that can be long lasting and things like that. There are so many different um, levels of intervention that can happen prior to something becoming a grievance. And I think that's a big culture shift that we need to have in our whole sector, which is when something happens, even if it feels maybe minor at the time, as someone who's received it, as someone who is involved in it, perceived it, seen it, it's speaking up about those incidents because they create those patterns. And that pattern of culture is so much harder to prove. Um, you know, you can talk to someone being like, actually, it feels really like weird and exclusionary in this section. And I can't really explain why it's just a series of small things that have happened. So being able to speak up and being able to talk about those different points where you've got multiple small things that happen and you can have earlier interventions with someone to say, hey, we're noticing this pattern or hey, this thing is happening that mean that you don't end up down all the path of severe bullying, harassment, allowing a toxic culture to be pervasive and, and get into the point of grievance. Um, and again, that's a cultural shift. You know, you know, if you're a PhD student and you've got a PI who holds all of the power over your PhD and your career, you know, how do you speak up in a situation like that to say, hey, that thing you said wasn't, wasn't quite right, didn't feel quite good. You know, you, you go, oh, it's a small thing, I won't mention. And then suddenly there's a hundred small things, you know, and it's, and it's because of that really, you know, the, the bigger the hierarchy, the bigger the power imbalance, the more likely there is there, um, that these things happen and the more likely there is um, a misuse of power as well. So I think that's something that we need to think about. It's like, what other structuring can happen around that that stops, that structurally stops those situations from happening? Um, and the other point I just wanted to note was around, um, a little bit around government and labor, but also some of the other stuff that was happening around sort of resistors, because I think it all falls into the same point, that there are people out there, there are people within different political parties who will resist this consistently and continually. Um, and they'll resist it for various reasons. Some of it will be very overt. They don't believe in it. They don't think it's the right thing to do. They don't see it as a problem. 
Others will resist it because it's a big change and it actually will personally conflict with their own perception of the world at that point. And actually that kind of learning curve, that kind of steep thing to go over means that we have a bigger thing to prove. We actually need to provide more than we should in order to get someone to change their mind because it's easier to stick with what currently is happening. You know? And I think that's something that we really need to lean on behavior change experts and cultural change experts and sociologists. You know, this isn't, I'm a geneticist. I, I don't have the answers for some of this. I have the systems change stuff because that's my background, but the rest of it kind of falls flat. And that's where you really need to collaborate outside of the sector as well. Thank you very much, Lillian. Now, I gather people online had trouble hearing me. I was told not to move the mic, so I've now completely ignored that advice. And if someone who's listening online could just confirm if they can now hear me, that would be great uh, via the Q&A. So let's go back to the questions in the room. Um, we've got loads of questions. I think we're just going to take a whole bat. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, hello, Palab Ghosh from BBC News. Um, well, I've been reporting a little bit on this area. And one of the common factors, particularly talking to very bright uh, young scientists, is that they feel they don't belong. I mean, you, you've, there are numerous statistics, and some of which have been presented here, that the higher up you go in the profession, the greater the problem. You know, uh, it's been heartbreaking to see you know, brilliant people with first-class degrees uh, choosing not to do a PhD because they don't feel they fit in. Um, and, and one of the things that, you know, certainly we're doing at the BBC, uh, not just across uh, science coverage, but across all our coverage, is to have a 50-50 a, a balance in sexes. It's harder to achieve um, a greater balance in terms of uh, ethnic diversity, but we are trying to do that as well. And I think that if people do see, you know, uh, professors and doctors talking about important science stories on the telly, then they're more likely to feel that they can do that. It's, it's no substitute for, a, you know, the entitlement that some people feel by having a family member. Um, but I think it, it, that is some remediation. Um, the other point that I'd make is the point about a power balance that uh, you talked about. You know, to my mind, I think that is the real issue because in a scientific career, it's the senior professor that who has power over you, and usually that's a kind of older uh, white man who, you know, and, and your career depends on that person taking you under their wing and enabling you to join quite an elite club. And I, I don't know what the answer to, to that is, but I think that, you know, to my mind, just as an observer outside and I'm not having done the academic study that all of you have done on it, that really does seem to be one of the biggest obstacles. Thank you, Pallav. And uh, one of my favourite definitions of confusion is really speaks to you know, an environment in which your sense of uniqueness and individuality can be in total harmony with your sense of belonging. So we hope that resonates. Let's collect some more um, comments and questions. Um, Gavin, good luck. <laughs> Hello, my name's Sharon. I'm the Chief Executive of the Association for Science and Discovery Centres. Thank you so much for your suite of talks. Um, there was some real resonant moments to talk about science capital approach, that talk about measurement and monitoring of data and the collective and collaborative approach here. Um, and so I've got a, a slightly selfish question because it's something that we're really working on. But when we're looking at, for example, the STEM pipeline, the classic STEM leaky pipeline, where it is not enough to have uh, large numbers of, you know, di huge diversity going into the pipeline um, when people cannot thrive, exactly as you said, Lillian, you, you know, people aren't thri thriving, they're not uh, flourishing. Equally with STEM engagement and STEM education, we cannot have a collective approach that purely measures the numbers of diverse bodies in a room. We have to be looking at more meaningful measures in our data of like equity and inclusive um, practice. So I'd like to ask the panel and, you know, belonging is, is potentially one of them. Actually, I think, uh, Kevin, you also mentioned belonging as well. Um, what would your, your date, what would you be looking for for that measurement? Uh, you know, because you could have a huge number of, of people and you might be turning them all off. You know, what would you want to be asking to find out if we are being inclusive and equitable 
with our practice of STEM engagement. Great question. Let's keep getting some more. Yeah, after that we'll go to this side. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christina Astin. I'm with Planet Possibility, which is a consortium of uh, five partners uh, working to widen diversity in physics specifically. Um, now, I come from a physics teaching background myself. I was once told by a, a parent of one of my students that I didn't look like a physics teacher. Yeah, I giggled too, but I, I, I now have find it slightly less funny and uh, it spurred me on to work in, the, in this space and, and I think actually the whole um, issue of not enough physics teachers and not enough science teachers is something that we do need the government to work on, we can't, uh, we can't ignore their role there. Um, I now work as an education consultant in science and partnerships and Planet Possibility has just recently, last week in fact, convened a physics diversity network to look at this whole area, EDI in physics specifically, and, and um, really very much along Kevin's uh, lines of connecting the, the bits of chocolate in the aero bar and trying to get collaboration going within physics. And my question really to the panel is STEM, brilliant, strength in numbers if we all join together across the S, T, E and M, but is there a role for us to separate out into our different sciences and our different disciplines because they have different challenges? You know, physics does suffer from a particular stereotypical, uh, you know, poor image uh, and maybe needs specific solutions to address it. Great. Well, I could have planted that question because it's one of the questions I would have wanted to uh, hear the panel's views on. I didn't. Um, so let's take one more, from, um, take one, one more from this side at the front, please. Um, and then we'll come back to the panel. We're going to have to answer very quickly so we can get through Th one more. Thanks so much. Colin Brown from Five Tribes. Um, as a white male, I just wonder where you would point me. And you criticised the government's response to the inquiry, saying that there was a lot of comments about DFE, the, the issue that was going to be solved by the DFE. Is one of the places you'd point me towards primary schools? Because I understand I do not go to primary schools as a teacher. Right, thank you very much. Um, so let's start the other end of the panel. Lillian, would you like to pick up uh, whichever one you want? We've, we had the first introduction from Calab. Uh, we've got the better metrics question, we've got the let's disaggregate STEM, and we've got the, the last question probably around science. Yeah, uh, and I know that we didn't touch on the international examples of good practice from before as well. And just to, the only thing that I will say on that one is that um, the, the, the kind of the legal frameworks that exist in international examples mean often there's a difficulty uh, translating some of those methods across. But I'm also not going to kind of go into the depths of some of that today because I think it would probably confuse and be a bit too deep for this right now. Um, the piece around um, power balance being a real issue and the kind of the actual kind of the, the supervisor supervisee relationship that we see can, that, can be, that can be quite harmful sometimes. And um, I think it's really important to recognize that the people who are in senior research positions at the moment haven't been promoted based on things like inclusive leadership or management um, skills. Um, by and large, it's based on academic records, it's based on the ability to do great research and things like that, but it doesn't include that kind of additional kind of people skill sponsorship mentoring aspect within that kind of values of excellence piece. We're starting to see some of that try and shift and change, but that's fundamentally where people are right now. And it's a really difficult conversation because actually what you're asking for people to do is to reflect on where they are in their career and say, have you got there based on just your, you know, your kind of research outputs alone? Or is there something else that's missing from your own skill set? And it, we've just not fostered a culture and an environment that would mean that many senior researchers are ready for those conversations. Some of them are, some of them want to have those, but there is also quite a difficulty there because of the competitive environment we're in. They're getting someone to kind of talk about gaps in their own kind of abilities while still trying to be applying for incredibly competitive positions and grants. It, it's, it's very hard to kind of to, to, to tweak that. So I think we're really reliant on um, the, the, the career frameworks that are existing and to be updated and improved that do include these things in there, that do include things around sponsorship, your, uh, what you're saying about, what you're doing about research culture, for example. Um, with, the, with the data piece, um, fully agree that the, the data isn't just the quantitative data. And I, I always use data as a shorthand for all types of data, but naturally within the STEM fields, often people just think quant data. All data is so important. The experiences of what people are actually having on a day-to-day -day basis um, is, is so essential to this work, because it, otherwise 
you cannot put a number on how much someone feels included. You cannot put a number on how much someone feels like they belong or how much they think that they should be um, successful within that career. Um, uh, I'm going to really skip on the sort of planet, the one from um, is there a role to separate out the, the subjects because the answer is yes and no. Um, but I'm actually going to hand over to the rest of the panel because I don't want to speak too long and then we're short on time. Thank you very much, Lee, and very good to be talking. Kevin, you pick up the baton from here. Okay, so um, separate or no, separate or not separate. I think it depends when. Um, and I think this, so when we're thinking about my own, if I think about a journey, if I'm starting with young, younger children, trying to help them understand what STEM and science and everything that's related to that has to offer is part of the challenge. So at Winter Fellowship, we run a program called Destination STEM. We have 17 year olds who are coming in trying to explore what science looks like. And for many of them, they don't understand the breadth of opportunities that are available. And part of our responsibility is to help people understand what those opportunities are. Now, as you get through the pipeline, and those leaky pipelines are there, we go back to my pipeline, um, it may be more important to actually have specialist knowledge about how you navigate a particular discipline, how you navigate a particular sector, whether that's within industry or, acad or the academy, in that journey. So whether it's different or together, it may actually really depend about when, and that goes back to this point about what's the most effective way to cultivate belonging. And belonging is really difficult because actually, when we look at our organization, our society does not reflect the diversity of our society. And that's a really difficult message to keep repeating because people think that I'm whining or that we're complaining. But actually, it's a lived experience. Every time you walk into a building where you don't see anything that looks like you, it's a challenge. And when we're thinking about providing opportunities for any platform, how do we provide opportunities that actually allow more junior members? So I'm going to, I've, there are lots of examples of good practice. So I'm going to quote, quote an example. We're here at the Royal Society of Chemistry. I'm going to quote an example where there is a drive to make sure that people who are more junior in their careers get access to speaking opportunities. And that's structured into how we plan events. Now, that's just a little quote of a good practice, but it's a practice that actually means that people who are junior get to present in front of all senior colleagues. And it builds up confidence. It builds up a sense that this could be me. Now, the point about whether or not a single intervention, there's a point about what, you know, what's that sense of belonging. There isn't a simple answer because when I think about what influences me to, in my journey over life, um, there isn't a single point that I can identify at the time. It's only in hindsight that I actually had the privilege of being able to evaluate that I went to an event or I attended a conference or I had a conversation with somebody that changed my perspective on something. And that hindsight isn't really easy in terms of how people want to assess impact. So whilst we all like to have, you know, we do something, we hope that we have an impact that we can measure, we actually may never really know in every context when that impact has actually happened. And we have to give ourselves permission to have some, what I would describe as a static approach to some extent in terms of how we try to engage people in STEM. Because actually the results may only be realized in 20 years time. Thank you very much, Kevin. That's very powerful. Rachel, over to you. So just pick up on the point around um, splitting out the subjects. I um, absolutely agree that it's a yes and no answer. And um, you know, prior to, to the role I currently hold, I was at the Royal Society of Biology, and, and that was often the challenge we had in conversations around DDI, was the issue was in chemistry and physics and biology. Oh, you're doing really well because you've got lots of women. But actually, when you dig under the surface, there's many more issues in the biosciences. It's just a different type of issue. And so I absolutely agree that we need to look at the subjects um, separately, but we also need to look at um, where are their um, collective commonality and then talk with that collective voice around those issues. The point around sort of belonging, again, uh, I agree with everything that's been said, and absolutely you need to see people who look like you, who walk like you, who act like you to, in order to see where you can get to. And I think one of the things that um, we still have an issue with is that we progress people through a very linear um, sort of a very linear approach and we assess impacts and we assess um, sort of their merit in using kind of old systems. One of the things that we can do more of is think about potential. How do we measure the potential of people, the potential for them to be that next golden star, that potential for them to maybe be excellent conveners to bring together people together? 
how do we create a network which is identifying all the different wonderful skill sets that each of each of us have and that's a challenge of data because we're talking about human beings and we're not a data point on a graph that you can very nicely sit in and put into a bucket there's so much richness to each and every one of us to our stories to where we've connected with people to um, those opportunities that have been open to us that like you said kind of in hindsight you can look back and pinpoint maybe those moments of change or those moments of um, a great connection that's taking you to that next place but it is ultimately only in hindsight when you can kind of recognize those however one of the things we can do is tell more of those stories um, and tell more of the human aspect behind success um, so that our young people start to see that the linear journey isn't the only one that zigzag careers are absolutely a thing the swirly the swirly approach to leadership is something that many people experience um, and often that sort of single linear trajectory is in the minority it's just it's the story that's been told for them well that's an amazing uh, place to bring this panel to a close on i'm sorry there were so many questions we didn't have time for both online and in the room um but i hope that you have found it a rich and stimulating discussion i think some of us were, were talking before the start about the fact that well hang on a minute we could have had the same topic uh 10 years ago and maybe we'll have in 10 years time but actually, the, the nature of the conversation that we had today is different from the one we would have had 10 years ago. There is a maturing and a, and a deeper sophistication of what we're talking about under that headline. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to expect more. When it, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't predict that oh, they're going to have the same conversation in 10 years' time. We can all play a role in determining whether or not that's going to be the case, partly through our expectations as well as through our actions. And in, in my final remarks, I wanted to just go back to the same basic principles I always talk about when people ask me, well, you know, how do we get better at diversity inclusion in almost any context? Um, and that's, you need consistent, sustained leadership. That means leadership from the government. It means leadership from people with leadership in their job titles. But it also means leadership in the sense that all of us in some way have privilege. And if we utilize that privilege to use it all for jargon, leverage that privilege to make things fairer, to improve the equity and the equality of opportunity and experience amongst people from other groups, that that's, that's a very important part of what leadership means. So that's the first thing. Secondly, we need this shared definition of success that means diversity and inclusion is embedded in what good looks like. Thirdly, we need to make sure that we do have a grip on the data. When we talk about EDI and STEM across all of those letters, we're talking about a whole bundle of different things. We do need to disaggregate that and be able to understand what do the data tell us about where we are across each of those letters, across each of the protected characteristics. We didn't get into that today, but there are definitely some where, you know, STEM is lagging, maybe disability, for example, um, be, being, uh, you know, an obvious one that springs to mind. Um, so making sure that we have a grip on the data. We need to make it practical for people to do the right thing. People can have a good intention, but they don't always know, well, what does that mean day to day in terms of how I behave? Things like the progression framework help there are loads of tools out there now. We need to be um, deploying those. And then lastly, we need to self-disrupt. You know, we need to bring the creativity that science, technology, engineering, and maths all have embedded within that to help tackle this sort of incremental shift that we've got used to and provide something that's more of a transformational shift. So whether that's by spending much more effort looking at those wiggly careers with upskilling and reskilling being an extraordinary opportunity to massively change both the representation of the culture within these subjects, or through deploying technologies such as VR and gamification to tackle bias in a more fundamental way. There are things that we can do. So I'd like to end by thanking our fantastic speakers, especially, um, you know, big shout out to Lillian who came in and you'd never have known uh, that this was a last minute addition to the panel. Lillian, you did a great <laughs> job, but Rachel and Kevin as well. Can we all give them a round of applause for their great contribution? <laughs> And I'd also like to thank the Royal Society of Chemistry and Perrot Labour once again for their support in putting on this event and Gavin and his team for all the hard work they do. You will receive an email survey following this event and we'd really appreciate it if you take a few minutes to provide feedback. If you're on Zoom, you're going to be taken there when you leave the meeting and if you're in the room, I think there's a way to fill it out now or you can click the QR code on the back of the programme. I'm reliably informed. Um, there'll be a recording of this event on the websites of the various organisations involved in the coming days. 
And for those joining us online, thank you so much. Uh, sorry about the sound issues. Goodbye to all of you. Have a good evening. And for those in the room, there are drinks and canapes ready. Don't get jealous online. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah.